Have you ever been so sure a project was going to work, only to four days after you've started it, wonder why you even thought that in the first place? Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff, and boy, have I done it this time. I've always had in my mind what would be really cool around the house is to have a server running somewhere in your house and then be able to remote into it but have a full desktop experience. And I don't mean just having access to your desktop files anywhere or being able to browse the web. I mean full 1080p 60 gaming or being able to video edit or do some other workstation like tasks from a system as simple as a Raspberry Pi with a monitor attached to it. And I don't mean just one user workstation either. I'm talking about three, four, five, six workstations that you can connect to from your house or remotely and have that full desktop experience. So when AJ, one of the patrons over on my Discord server, mentioned Newegg was having a flash sale on the NVIDIA Tesla K10 cards for only $40 a piece, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with them. Now the Tesla K10 is only an NVIDIA compute card, which means it does not actually do any 3D rasterization, and CUDA is disabled if you try to pass this through to the drivers in a virtual machine. However, there are a number of workarounds to actually get gaming working on a Tesla K10. But what makes the Tesla K10 so appealing for a project like this? Well, for starters, there are two GPUs on the back of this PCB, which is actually becoming a rarity in GPUs these days. These are Kepler-based GK104 GPUs with four gigabytes of memory each for a total of eight gigabytes of memory for the entire card. Now, NVIDIA did make a consumer version of this card with only two gigabytes of video memory each, but you know it better as the GTX 690. But again, NVIDIA disabled the 3D functionality of the Tesla K10 to make this a compute-only card for server farms. But what do you want to do if you want to game on this card? Well, you pick up the card that's identical in every way, shape, and form except for the firmware on board, and that is the NVIDIA Grid K2. And yeah, if you're keeping track at home, that means I've bought four cards for this project so far. Now again, when I say identical, I mean identical in every single way on the PCB. These are the exact same cores with the exact same memory with the exact same PCB and heatsink layout. It's just this one can play games and this one can't. One thing you will notice right away about both the Tesla K10 and the Grid K2 cards is that there's actually no video outputs present on these cards. Now, normally if you wanted a game with PCI Express pass-through inside a virtual machine, that would be a deal breaker because you wouldn't be able to set up a virtual monitor on either of these. However, I'm going to be streaming my gaming over the network, so this actually isn't going to be an issue. Now, I will fully admit at this point in the story that when I bought the Tesla K10s, I was not aware that virtualized GPU or vGPU support was was not enabled on these particular cards. I did, however, get extremely lucky through a lot of research. When looking for information on how to enable vGPU support in the Tesla K10, I stumbled across a years old forum post on the EEV blog. It was centered around converting standard consumer cards into their professional counterparts, a la a GTX 680 into a Quadro K5000. In particular, there was one user in the thread who mentioned he was able to convert a Tesla K10 into a Grid K2 card but he failed to mention in the forum post how he did it or where he got the BIOS for the Grid K2 as it's not publicly available. So I was kind of left in that XKCD Wisdom of the Ancients type limbo. So on a hope and a prayer, I emailed him and actually heard back. And we've actually been working together for the last three or so weeks on getting a Grid K2 BIOS and figuring out the resistors that we need to modify on the Tesla K10 as it does require a physical modification to the card. The way the Tesla K10 is identified by your computer is actually an analog reading set by a set of resistors on top of the GPU. And he was able to identify which resistors I needed to modify. I haven't done that yet, but he was able to successfully do that part of it. And he actually let me know where he bought the resistors and which ones to do. And here they are. This is gonna be fun. Tune into the next video if you wanna see if I'm actually successful in modifying these into grid K2s. The second part of the modification turned out to be actually a little bit more difficult than microsoldering. It was tracking down a Grid K2 BIOS file. Now, that BIOS file isn't publicly available as the only way you could get it is by ordering a Dell or an HP server and having a Grid K2 come with it. And the only files they provide are updates to that BIOS file. It's not actually a full BIOS dump. So the only way we were going to get a Grid K2 BIOS is by physically having a Grid K2. So that's why I bought this. Unfortunately, this one Grid K2 cost about four times what one of the Tesla K10s did. And this one didn't even come with screws to hold the heat sinks in place. They were just floating around inside the shroud. So thanks for that, random eBay seller. 
But before I went about spending all the time modifying the Tesla K10s, I decided to see if the Grid K2 would actually work the way I wanted to. Now, before this whole project actually started, I was already toying with the idea of doing a home lab tutorial on used server gear, and so I was already thinking about picking up a new used server box, but this just gave me kind of the nudge over the edge that I needed. What I ended up picking up was the 2U server you see behind me in the Dell R7610. It's a 2U box that I picked up for $230 plus $50 shipping. It came with two quad-core E5-2643 processors, 3.3 gigahertz with a 3.7 boost clock, and 64 gigs of ECC DDR3 1600 megahertz memory. But if we're gonna have potentially six GPUs and six individual players on this thing, I can't leave it at just eight cores. So I picked up a pair of E5-2670V2 10-core CPUs running at 2.6 gigahertz and an extra 128 gigabytes of RAM just for good measure. But today, though, we're only running with the 8 cores and 64 gigs of RAM that the server came delivered to me with. And yes, I love saying only in that sentence. Now, even though the Grid K2 does support PCIe pass-through and vGPU support, this was an absolute nightmare to get working. To keep this video to a reasonable length, I'm just going to say I tried probably 9 or 10 different hypervisor solutions for running the Grid K2, and I was met with a litany of problems with every single one of them. The biggest problem I ran into is that even though the Grid K2 does support PCIe pass-through, so that means I can pass through one of the GK104 cores with four gigabytes of memory to a VM, if Nvidia detects that it's running in a virtual machine, it disables it and you get a code 43 in your driver. While this is a pretty well-documented problem with Nvidia disabling cards inside virtualized environments, I wasn't able to use any of the proposed solutions inside the forums. The solutions were usually twofold. Number one, trick the hypervisor into not passing any VM information through so Nvidia can't detect it. That's simple enough. Part number two of that solution is disabling the Microsoft Basic Display Adapter that your hypervisor automatically passes through, and then plugging in a dummy HDMI cable into the back of your graphics card so it thinks that there's a monitor plugged in. However, you can see an obvious problem with this particular card. So, to game on a Grid K2 slash Tesla K10, I need to enable vGPU support, which is virtualized graphics card support. That is only supported in a grand total of two hypervisors. Number one, we have Citrix Zen Server, and number two, we have VMware ESXi. Are you ready for more bad news? Because I certainly wasn't. You can only use Kepler-based GPUs up to certain versions of both of those operating systems. With VMware, it's ESXi 6.0 and 6.5. No other exceptions made. For Citrix, you get a little bit wider variety with four versions to choose from between 6.2 and 7.1. However, after starting at the newest of every revision and working my way down, the only operating system I could get to recognize the Grid K2 as a vGPU supported GPU was Citrix Zen Server 6.2, which is the oldest of the bunch. To give you an idea of how old, when I went to install a virtual machine, it recommended Ubuntu version 12.04 and Windows 8.0. I did go ahead and install Windows 10. However, the driver on the virtual operating system has to match the driver that you install on the host operating system. They have to match, and in this case, the drivers did not support Windows 10 at all, and I ended up with a code 43 again. So I bit the bullet and swallowed my pride and installed Windows 8.1. And much to my surprise, after about four days of pure frustration and testing and uninstalling and reinstalling, Windows 8.1 as a guest client actually booted up, worked just fine, and the driver installed and everything just worked. Now for the secret sauce that I wanted to use with this project, as again, I wanted to pass through the entire desktop at 1080p 60 and be able to use any program that I wanted, including just the Windows desktop, over the network through a thin client, not directly attached with a monitor and keyboard and mouse to the server. So things like Steam Link and direct attached connections are automatically disqualified. I decided to go with Parsec, a free cloud gaming solution that you can host at home. If you have a Windows 8.1 or higher, thank God it supports Windows 8.1 still, Windows 8.1 or Windows 10 or an Ubuntu-based server, you can pass through your entire desktop to a thin client as small as a Raspberry Pi 3. I installed Parsec, logged in, and was immediately greeted with my Windows desktop at 1080p 60. So far, so good. And now for some bad news that quite honestly, I just never saw coming. While the Tesla K10 and the Grid K2 both support NVENC, which by the way, these also both support an unlimited number of streams so long as you have the GPU horsepower to back them up. And since these have two GPUs, they are absolutely incredible. So if you are a Plex streamer, stop buying the Pascal P2000s and pick up a Grid K2 or a Tesla K10 for like 40 bucks. This'll do all of your transcoding needs. 
While these do support NVENC, they don't actually pass through NVENC to the host in vGPU mode. So while Parsec is more than capable of sending a full 1080p60 desktop stream over the network to a thin client, without NVENC, the CPU overhead is, well, quite high as it used about 30% of my six threads, and it honestly just looked terrible. But besides the difficulties getting it set up, what was it actually like to use on the network? Honestly, it was kind of a mixed bag still. I was able to play some games, and there were moments where it was absolutely fantastic. Then there were other moments where it was dreadfully terrible. So where do we stand thus far? Well, the good news is I was actually able to boot into Windows 8.1 and get into a game and play it at a pretty reasonable tick some of the time. There were other times when the experience was pretty much unplayable though. But I know the metric you're all dying to know is, does a system like this run Crisis? Running Crisis, we got an average of 66 FPS with a 0.1% low of just 37, so a perfectly playable frame rate. However, getting into some esports titles, which is where I really see this thing shining as a 6 gamer 1 CPU system, has a little bit of a different story. Rocket League at 1080p high settings managed an average FPS of 68, with a 0.1% low of 9. So, the first couple of tests, not a lot of great news here. Number one, I'm stuck to one version of one hypervisor with Windows 8.1, and the frame rate is stuttery at best, and the compression is horrible at worst. But I'm not quite ready to throw in the towel on the system. I think there is a lot of improvements that can be made. Number one, one thing you'll notice is the Tesla K10 and the Grid K2 are both fanless cards. They rely on airflow from the server. Now, on my R7610, I was having a problem ramping up the fans to a high enough speed to get enough airflow through this, so I was constantly hitting about 92 Celsius in which the card will start to throttle. It also did actually shut down the card on me a couple times when it hit 97, so that is something that I can certainly solve. There are some more glaring problems with this type of setup, but I think we will get into that in the next video. In the next video, I have seen enough to try to take this thing full scale. I am going to go ahead and modify the Tesla K10s into Grid K2 cards and try running three of these in that server and see what it gets me. Barring all of that actually not working, I do have a backup plan in which this server will run six gamers at the same time. So stay tuned for that if you're curious on seeing my troubleshooting steps or if you just want to see me fail in general. As always, make sure to like this video if you liked it, dislike it if you didn't like it, and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. And be sure to join my Patreon to take part in my Discord server. You'll get exclusive access to the server where you can chat with myself and the other hosts from Talking Heads. That's going to do it for me in this one, guys. Thank you as always so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video. Cheers, all. Today's beer is from Lompoc Brewing in Portland, Oregon. It is the Barrel Aged Red on Rye, a 6% red ale that's obviously been barrel aged. That's got a real malty with like a toffee, almost a butterscotch smell to it. Oh, that's going to be good. Oh, everything I had hoped for in this one. <laughs> This beer is so good. I'm just going to say that right off the bat. If you like a good English red ale or an Irish red ale, oh my gosh, this is quintessential what that should taste like. And shockingly enough, it's from a Portland brewer. Usually Oregon is not known for its English ales all that much. We're much more of an IPA centric brewing area. But this is just fantastically malty. It's rich. It's almost like a, like a velvet cake kind of feel to it. It is so smooth. The the barrel notes, the little bit of oak and char are coming through just enough, but they're perfectly balanced with that red ale maltiness. This is just perfect. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I don't know how much more of a reviewer you're going to get than that. That's just a phenomenal beer.